Good evening. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming to tonight's Artist and Artist Lecture. I'm Kelly Kivlin, Associate Curator at DIA. And I guess technically this is our first lecture of spring. Um, and we have a few more after, but it's such a pleasure to welcome Mika Tajima, who will be speaking on Franz Erhel Walter, um, of which we've just actually released, or will be, uh, we've printed and have a book on its way to us very shortly. It will be available in early April on a work in our collection called First Work Set. Um, and tonight, though, Mika will be talking more broadly about his practice and in relationship to her own. We will have a question and answer period after her talk, so you're welcome to, of course, ask some questions then. Um, I just want to say a couple of thanks to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their generous support of this series, and to Brooklyn Brewery, of course, for the beer. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce Mika, who I've had the chance to get to know over the last few years, whose practice ex explores the way the built environment shapes our physical experience and perspective. She was born in Los Angeles in 1975 and received her MFA from Columbia University in New York and also attended the Fabric Workshop and Museum Apprentice Training Program in 2003. She had had solo exhibitions at several venues, including Art in General New York in 2014, Aspen Art Museum Colorado in 2011, Seattle Art Museum the same year, and Bass Mu Museum of Art in Miami in 2010. And her work was also included in the Whitney Biennial in 2008. She also recently presented three series of recent works at 11R Gallery, which was a critic's pick by Art Forum for its exploration of, quote, the symbiotic relationship between design and human affect aided by data scrapping technology. For those that saw it, it was really an incredible and prolific show. Um, it spanned two different rooms of the gallery, and um, it received a lot of wonderful recognition. This summer, she's been commissioned to realize a temporary public art project of vast, uh, disappearing work, I guess. We'll all have to go and see or not see. Um, this summer at the Sculpture Center, and she will have a solo show at the Wadsworth Museum of Art in 2017. She is also um, part of the music-based performance group New Humans, and she is, lives and works in Brooklyn. Thank you again, and please join me in welcoming Mika. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Kelly, for that introduction, and also for inviting me to this um, uh, to do this lecture on. Um, well, I, I guess I was it was my choice to choose Franz Erhard uh, Walter, uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, before I um, start, I want to acknowledge um, Howie Chen for advising, and also um, Augusto Arbizo, um, John Van Doren. Um, Dorsey Waxer at 11R for their support. Um, I'm very honored to uh, speak here tonight um, as part of the Artists on Artists uh, lecture series here at DIA. Um, it's sort of a daunting task to, um, uh, you know, give my perspective on an artist, any of the artists actually in their collection or um, all these artists who have been already written into history books. Um, and um, I was really drawn to speak on Walter since um, my work um, interrogates space and form with um, specific interest in how technologies, including art, control and affect the body. Um, throughout my work, I've been looking at how material, can, material form can imply a certain body, um, both visible and, and distant and sometimes not apparent. Um, so this includes how the built environment shapes our movements and actions, how design objects form our bodies, and how even art objects can profile a type of viewer. So naturally when looking at um, Walter's work in material forms, I think about what kind of body, subject, and participant do, does the work imply or even demand. Um, consistent throughout his career, 
uh, Walter's action pieces and installations um, address the viewer and implies a, a willing participant seeking discovery through a material experience um, within the framework of his art. Um, I think the reason why um, Walter's work resonates for us today um, is because it somehow prefigures a contemporary subject within the managerial regime of our time. Um, under this regime, there's a demand for the self-motivated, flexible, and open subjects put into action and transformation. Uh, the prevalent um, imperative seems to be you must be free, which is something that you'll see characterizes a lot of like his uh, um, Im implicit demands in his work. Um, and this is administrated on all levels, including the regulation of the human body, behavior, workspaces, spaces, leisure time, and life activities. Um, how can one be directed to be free or to speculate modes of autonomy when presented with a structure that allows for small degrees of freedom? And this is the dilemma of our time. Um, from my perspective, Walter's work embodies the transit from the artistic explorations of the 60s to its subsequent uptake into the, into the society and culture we have today. So this administration of freedom in the form of self-regulation, essentially. Both the idea and the form of Walter's work contains this tension and contradiction of this imperative to create a controlled environment, to generate new practices and subjectivities that are free from old ways and concepts, but nonetheless are, um, have a sort of directed um, way of, of, um, of being. So uh, Walter writes in his diary in 1969, one has to have the freedom to decide for or against the, the work. Compulsion or even just situations of a compulsory nature destroy everything. In this context, we can contextualize his work from the parallax view of the present and the past. So I'm, I want to be conscious of like the, the time period in which he you know, began thinking about what the possibilities of um, um, stretching the demands and the boundaries of that this kind of practice and how we view this evolution of like this type of work today. Um, I was actually introduced to um, Walter's work in grad school by um, Rickard Tirvanit, who was um, a very influential teacher of mine. Um, and the obvious connection between um, Walter, Rickard, and myself is this idea of the relational type of work involving an intersubjective exchange with people and objects, but within a constructed situation. Um, the image that you see here on the, uh, on the projection is a piece um, that prompted Rickard to introduce me to his work. And it's, as you can see, it was a wearable sculpture um, I was making at the time and um, the stripes, of course, extending off of the shirt, which connects to other, another, uh, three other shirts. Um, and there's a, creating a kind of material circuit of performers. Um, the sculpture was something that, of course, required action in a performing body. Um, and it was an early form for me to sort of um, experiment with these structures that require the body or imply something bodily. Um, and how it relates to the shaping of social activity, um, creating like boundaries and power, sort of power dynamics. Um, and an additional aspect of this work was that um, my, my uh, band, New Humans, wore, wore these um, shirts and we did these sort of um, circuit-based um, noise performances. Um, um, so it became this both a material performance and a sonic object in a sense, and um, it was really it was creating this kind of like um, physical boundary as well as like a sort of sound barrier between us and the audience itself. Um, so that was kind of the early stages in graduate school, and um, later I started focusing more on the built environment and bodies in action. Um, within different structures. So it's through installation, um, stage set arrangements, and um, 
architecture of production spaces such as like recording rooms or um, film production or film sets. And um, I was particularly interested in activities defined by uh, divisive type of spaces um, in which objects outline performer um, action and viewer positions. Um, so, you know, this is an um, image of um, a show from 2007, and essentially it's um, painting panel walls that are, act as also like cubicle dividers or like a recording room setup. And so throughout the duration of the exhibition, the configuration of the, the show would change shape according to um, different types of um, activities. Um, and this was a collaboration with um, performance collaboration with Fido Akanchi and uh, Spencer Yan and, and the New Humans. Um, and later, more collaborations in a related vein with Charles Atlas um, at South London Gallery in 2011, which is um, film production as performance, and uh, we Im investigate the politics of walking for this particular film performance. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm quite interested in the particular formal and conceptual practices um, surrounding the works of Walter. Um, just to give you like a little bit of a background, um, um, Walter became, uh, started out as a painter experimenting with different modes of painting and sculpture and um, was very interested in developing an art that directly addressed the body and underlined art as the act of doing. Um, so his influences included artists such as um, Lucio Fontana, Yves Klein, and um, Piero Manzoni, among others. Um, and while he was at the Offenbach Academy, um, where he studied, um, he came into contact with um, Joseph Boyce, Jörg Immendorf, Hannah Darboven, and later his fellow students included um, artists such as Blinky Palermo, um, Gerhard Richter, Polka, uh, Conrad Lug. Um, amongst others. Um, and he maintained varying degrees of um, contact with these other artists, but I think he was very singularly separate from the way that his peers and um, students um, worked. So from 63, um, Walter began to, oops, Walter began to engage um, viewers and create work out of action. And so he's experimenting how um, sculpture and human action could be materially, materially linked. Um, so he started making sculptural forms, which were sewn by his, um, his then wife, um, Johanna, who was still involved with, um, I believe he's is still involved with making the works. Um, and these are of course made of um, utilitarian, sturdy fabric, um, which he began calling work pieces or action pieces. And these works were um, designed and formed around bodily actions involving parts of the body like the hands or um, soon the head and then the whole body. Um, each of these individual works became um, parts of uh, cohesive ensembles called work sets. Um, and of course, as Kelly mentioned, Dia has collected the first work set um, from 63 to 69, I believe, were was the period of time those were made. Um, and by the 70s, uh, mid-70s, he stopped demonstrating the works and started to um, show them, show these work sets in um, non-activated installation settings, so more like in a storage, in storage, um, uh, in storage forms, which were called um, logger forms. Um, and then, these special shelves were um, shown along with uh, photographs and drawings often. Um, so instead of active participation, the storage form installations um, targeted the viewer's awareness of the potential and um, the potential implied in the pieces in storage. So I guess it's more about imagining how these could be activated. Um, and so then this sort of uh, method of showing the works became um, a very standard way of showing the work. Um, so that's just sort of a quick fly through. Um, but a few weeks ago, I was lucky enough to um, see uh, Walter himself demonstrate um, the work set book here um, for the book launch of the forthcoming book. 
Um, and it was particularly interesting um, after having read quite a lot about his work and his thoughts um, written in the diary, um, to hear firsthand from him while he was basically narrating as he was going through the motions of um, the different pages, or I don't know if you would call them pages, the different aspects of the book, um, how one should encounter the objects, um, and also comments about the uh, misconceptions about um, his work throughout the years um, by participants and also um, viewers. Um, at the at the demonstration, I I was particularly struck by how um, reverent and receptive the the audience was, as opposed to um, what he was talking about this sort of historical um, the early uh, reception of his work in the '60s, where um, it wasn't the general reaction to sort of understand where how to encounter the work or what the work was kind of about. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's obvious to say that, you know, Walter, as, as well as his peers, were at the forefront of this sort of, um, the borders of where objecthood, concept, performance, action, all were meeting and were developing in that sort of late 60s, early 70s period. Um, and so, you know, at that time, of course, it was um, difficult perhaps to read like what, um, what that work and those practices were. But now we're, you know, much, um, excuse me, um, you know, we're more aware of how to encounter these pieces. Um, so during the mid to late 60s, um, you know, there were the different artistic uh, modes, the experiments that were, um, you know, going on with uh, people's work at the time. Um, were in parallel to the demands of the participatory democracies, um, challenging singular traditional modes and hierarchies. And um, this, this was the case um, for some like Boys or um, Graciela Carnavale, the slides you see here, um, who were working um, with the social and performance-based works that were, um, these new forms were directly linked to sort of political or social, um, um, socially motivated meaning, um, the form itself housed the content. Um, so the, the image you see up here is um, Carnevale's um, work called Confinement Action from 1968, and um, it's basically um, inviting gallery viewers to um, an opening, and she, uh, the audience was unknowing, and she locked them into the gallery, and um, her expectation was for um, the audience to break themselves out of the gallery. Um, and um, it, this was a, um, her attempt at exemplary violence, she called it. It was to self-liberate um, from the oppression of um, mirroring the recent military government coup just in Argentina like two years prior to this, uh, this, this piece. Um, and I thought it would um, also to mention a quote by Boyce, um, he says, only on condition of a radical widening of definitions will it, be, will it be possible for art and activities related to art to provide evidence that art is now the only evolutionary, revolutionary power from his state of freedom. The position of freedom that he experiences at first hand learns to determine the other positions of the total artwork of the future social order. So Walter, as a formalist and materialist foremost, um, however, he maintains um, his work in a tight register of sculpture um, and denies any um, content to his form. Um, his action pieces were to be seen as an encounter of the body object with material. So he resists any kind of meaning, um, content, or political social claims, which is you know, continues even to like a couple weeks ago when I saw the performance, or he wouldn't call it a performance, the demonstration. Um, his investment was in sculpture, um, specifically bringing an awareness of behavior and self through the object. Um, it was a program to reify sculpture in total, to include the body, mind, action, and material as one. 
Walter summarizes the directive of his work in relation to the fir first work set. Be in this. You are a sculpture. You can see yourself as a sculpture. When you enter the work, you are a sculpture, if you want to be or not. Your body can be defined as sculpture. The self-discovery Walter seeks in the participant is one of consciousness and self-reflexivity in relation to sculpture. Um, the key, I think, to understanding Walter's relationship with viewers um, and the implicit, implicit demand for their active inclusion is perhaps located in this uh, photograph from 1964, documenting a, a fluxist um, group event in West Germany in which um, he spontaneously interrupted the, uh, the forum by climbing over the desks and spraying this pine scent over everybody, the, the audience, um, and thereby sort of drawing everybody into this collective sensorial encounter. Um, and so this passive audience somehow becomes enclosed within the work. Um, and structurally, uh, this work emanates directly from the artist, um, and he defines the space and the experience of the work for people. So in short, I would say that Walter's work addresses a total body experience with sculpture. Um, with the early work set pieces, um, there is a centering of Walter as the demonstrator and the creator of the work and the creator of the work and the experience. And at the same time, it contains strains of a radical pedagogy that hands over discovery to the users within the bounds of the work's conceit. Um, this is the tension that's inherent in the work and one that Walter articulates throughout his diary. People should clearly realize, he says, however, that they ultimately have to make do with their own possibilities and abilities. Training, help, enablement has to be supplied, but the formation of dependencies of any kind is undesirable. So you can kind of um, start to see this inherent contradiction, I think, in the work. So returning to my initial question in Walter's work, um, what kind of body, subject, participant does the work imply or even demand? How does the work seek to, seek to shape the body and its actions? As Walter describes the works, he speaks about the proportion of the body and how one should encounter the works by activating where the body's Im implied and designed to fit. Whether the work is described as a form for the body, suited for a normal body, or related to the body, um, in addition, terms such as open work definition, materialization of time, constitution of reality, and interior shaping are part of the vocabulary Walter has used to create his work. For me, where the body is implied is one of the key aspects that interests me. Um, as my own work and research um, looks at these modern techniques, that are used to shape our experiences um, of the body and space and time. Um, specifically, technologies developed um, that takes the human body as a target of um, power and control, especially in the turn towards um, management of the body through self-regulation and work in society. So in regards to Walter's work, um, Gregory, Wal Gregory Williams' essay, The Demonstration of Agency, which is in the, the new book that's coming out, um, the first work set catalog describes this aspect of his work, that at the crux of the work, it is about control and the dialectic of self-regulation, in that participants learn that self-regulation is always tied to an object. Developments from friction with an object, including other people. So um, Walter prov provides um, instructions on usage, but allows um, for certain ambiguity for the participants to negotiate. So being aware of their own body, being aware of their movements and behavior in relation to the others uh, in the exhibition space or perhaps within the sculptural objects themselves. Um, unlike open-ended works, Walter's work is procedural and contingent on the participants that relies on their self-memory and direction in a ritual manner. Folding, refolding, posture, um, exchanges, etc. So um, 
through exercise with these objects, the participant is able to experience the tension between structures and individuals through a tactile, the tactile contact um, with the material. Um, of course, all of this is sort of interpretation of his work, um, and it's, you know, he's probably would deny some of what I've just said. Um, however, this is the read I'm sort of um, gonna go with, with um, in relation also to how I, um, how I, uh, how I'm working. Um, but to look at his work in the context of, you know, 40 years later to, um, um, and to see um, um, both the historical context and how, um, how we can read it now. Um, in a way to escalate the tension that's inherent in the concept and the participatory dynamics of um, his work. Um, so in thinking about this today, um, my own sort of recent research um, into this tension has culminated in um, a series of work of mine called Total Body Conditioning. Um, and it's taken from an exercise, exercise regimen um, which is meant to prepare the body for endurance and um, flexibility and performance and um, through the intense seriation of um, time and the partitioning of bodily space. Um, and it's, I actually took it from um, New York Sports Club has a class called that, but um, um, in short, it's you know, making the whole body like a formed working object. Um, it's sort of a perverse realization of um, transforming a willing body into like a sculptural form or a material, which I think Walter's, Walter was experimenting with or, ha or continues to experiment with. So um, total body conditioning refers to this complete investment of the body, um, taking the Greek practice to care for oneself into the Foucauldian register of discipline and control exacted on the self. Um, this demand for a total investment of the body is what is very pervasive these days um, in the spaces of work, leisure, and self-care that have merged into one zone. Implied, um, the body implied, sorry, the implied body of our time is one that is um, willing and totally committed um, and in a sense made object. Um, so this is an, a piece of mine called Epimelet, Epimelestai Sauto, which is Greek for to take care, um, to take care of oneself. And it's um, a multi-seat hot tub spa, um, which is both a social site, it's a machine for bodily rejuvenation. Also, um, uh, it's, uh, you can see that the body form is actually um, inscribed in the shape of the tub itself, the ergonomics of it. Um, the technology underlying this hot tub form um, has its roots in aviation and also, of course, um, medical therapy before um, evolving to address relaxing the body after work or, or socially. Um, you know, here the body is implied much like, I guess, um, Walter's work implies the body. Um, but here it's inverted and um, displayed like a pictorial plane. And it's also where abstraction meets figuration. So back to Walter. Um, throughout his diary, um, he describes this need for the participant and the space to be open. But this means um, more about the subject being willing to be engaged and um, receptive to his demonstration. Um, uh, but also to self-explore variations of freedom within the structure presented. So in a sense, it's like not quite an open structure. Um, openness is treated like a desire that confronts a constricted material reality. Um, so what kind of self-discovery is possible in a physical experience um, of a constructed sculptural object? Um, in activating the objects, there is to be some kind of elevation through the awareness or realization of the materials and your body. But what is this? What are the realizations in the moment, moments of the, this contemplation? Um, according to Walter, there is something to be realized in the consciousness of the, the facts and the manipulations of the, the work set and to elucidate the factors of time, distance, environment, mental and physical condition, consciousness, movement, extension, relationships, transmission, 
liquefaction, contraction, et cetera, in relation to this work. But there's never any step further. Um, the potential radicality of Walter's work can be located in a strain of conceptual modernism that believed in the aesthetic and critical experience of art made entirely transparent, dispelling the myth of the uh, dispelled, uh, sorry, dispelled of myth and representation, leaving only the plain truth and the material facts of the objects. Um, in activating a Walter sculpture, one notionally participates in a material and subjective transformation, something like being part of a truth, um, truth revealing process. However, this interpretation holds only if this type of truth through transparency is not a modernist myth in itself. In hindsight, it has become clear that it is some kind of myth, um, or at least in our contemporary condition, um, it's about the cruelty and contradictions of a modernist transparency, in which everything is disclosed, yet there's no apparent escape from the structures of control and domination. So if you think of WikiLeaks, um, illegal police violations, global banking system, American imperialism, et cetera. Um, in the real, I believe uh, the self-discovery at hand in Walter's work is the experience of the individual being rendered as a subject as object within a given structure. There is a notion that there's some sort of self-awareness or self-improvement through the body. This physical practice, like an asana in yoga or an, a kneeling um, position in prayer, is a way to affect the mind through the body held in position. So this is um, the uh, demonstration a few weeks ago. And as I think back on Walter giving his demonstration of the work set book, I think about the contemplative viewers watching him move through various positions, like watching um, a yogi. Now in this time, it is fully understood how, um, how the works are to be encountered and performed or demonstrated, underlying the impossibility of um, uh, the type of conditions Walter imagined in which there were no preconceived notions um, to interfere with the material experience of the work. Um, and this is related both to an exposure awareness of this type of participatory model and practice, and perhaps also now the compliant and primed participant or viewer, um, this awareness of behavior, which is a kind of uh, self-regulation, is reflected in how Walter provides clear instructions in which to encounter and activate objects, and then the injunctions against misuse of the work. I'm sorry, this slide shows. Okay, here. Um, I link both the idea of Walter's objects as vehicles, instruments, tools, to the Foucauldian idea of a disciplinary machine or equipment. Quoting Foucault, it is an enclosure that works space in a flexible and detailed way. It does this first of all on the principle of partitioning. Each individual has his own place, and each place its individual. This discipline produces uh, subjected and practiced bodies uh, made object together. Um, in describing a compliant body, Foucault writes, a body is docile that may be subjected, used, transformed, and improved. So much like the, idea, um, the ideal figure of the soldier, the soldier has become something that can be made out of a formless clay an, an apt body, the machine required can be constructed. Posture is gradually corrected. A calculated constraint runs slowly through each part of the body, mastering it, making it pliable, ready at all times, turning silently into the automatism of habit. These were always meticulous, often minute techniques, but they had their importance because they defined a certain mode of detailed political investment of the body a new microphysics of power. Oh, sorry. Um, with the lack of discursive language um, and his own reticence about his work in the initial, um, um, the initial um, reception of his work, 
Walter increasingly focused on installation display and photography of his works as a proxy uh, for his object demonstrations. Um, the direction of his photography was very controlled and had a very industrial aesthetic, sort of similar to safety manuals or uh, machinery instructions, a kind of um, demonstration of how to act given specific forms. Um, these photos are of anonymous and interchangeable bodies in, in non-specific spaces and landscapes. Um, by vacating the photography of theatricality and site specificity, Walter was able to achieve a literalness of sculpture and the specific actions required by them, the participant is in a vacuum. This dry aesthetic, of course, is reminiscent of industrial and mental hygiene photography and film. Um, and despite um, his conceptual conceit with photography, this meshing of artistic and industrial um, aesthetic produces an interesting dissonance, I think. There is a sense that the body is an input object um, within a non-specific and even a historical space, put to work and shaped. And I think again about the notion of a daily practice or a mundane physical exercise of the body. What shape the body can be formed into and how the body becomes thing within the object that um, it is forming. Can an object be used to change the body? What kind of material is the body? So in parallel fields of industrial design and ergonomics, um, which are, of course, um, set to achieve similar relationships between the body and object, um, sort of thinking of um, um, design equipment, systems and devices that are uh, fit to the human body and its cognitive abilities, sort of activating the body. Um, here's a potential of self-realization to be maximized via institutional structures. So it's like these um, industrial fitness regime, regimens and team building exercises um, which fully um, integrate work, self-care, and life itself. So this is something I just pulled off the internet. Um, and this is a very pixelated close-up of this team building exercise. Um, but following um, Walter's logic of the objects being instruments or vehicles or even equipment in a way, the subjected body is trained and transformed. The work set becomes a whole methodology of practice, exercise, shaping, manipulation, and ultimately soft control. These minute details in each form prefigure the various disciplinary practices that have become so familiar in contemporary life, this administration of freedom. Um, and so as design and managerial imperatives um, adopt very similar approaches, forms, and techniques which um, emphasize flexibility, adaptability, willingness to connect with others, um, the body is really maximized for the most optimal position. Um, and in my own work, I draw a lot from um, these various design objects. Um, that have meshed the artistic and industrial imperatives that have, um, you know, that I've laid out here. So this is an image of um, uh, a chair called the variable balance chair, which was invented by Peter Opsvik in uh, 1979, and um, the designer wanted to emphasize the importance of um, variation in the object. But you can see, of course, that this type of chair literally shapes the body in we are in service of this object. Um, and the body itself has to negotiate form within a certain allowable variation of usage. So um, he write, the designer writes, like with all other chairs, it is important to use it actively, changing sitting angle and sitting position. Variable may, may be the chair for conscious users who like to sit actively, finding the proper equilibrium for their upper bodies and for their heads. By sitting actively, users can strengthen their back and their abdominal muscles. So this is another kind of seat um, designed by the same designer, um, which is even more evolved version of this kind of um, object chair, 
made for the body. Um, and he states here, taking your chair along may be practical because it will always be there when you need a place to sit. In practice, this chair is intended to be a tool for people whose jobs require them to work on the ground or on the floor. So just a close-up of what this chair object could be. And um, this type of design is occurring during the development of um, fitting a job to a person rather than the other way around. Um, and this is um, a settu chair, which is um, another uh, furniture object I refer to in my work. Um, and here you can see the sort of spine um, reference, uh, which is called the kinematic spine. And of course, using again the human form as both the reference and also the thing to control the, the body as an object. Um, uh, and then the, the mesh of the seat itself is also um, a performance mesh, which is um, similar to something in like sportswear, like you know your Nike shoes or your running tights. It's breathable, it gives support and tension, and it contours to the body. So I think that's another interesting parallel there. Um, and another early predecessor is the cubicle design, um, which was invented also in the late 60s, um, produced then in the, it was invented in the late 60s, but then went into, um, mass production in the 70s. And of course, this is like an idealized flexible space um, to maximize worker autonomy um, and the ability to work in a variety of settings and um, essentially creating a landscape in which people work in different um, environments. Um, it's called the Action Office um, and described in its own marketing materials Offices must be a total system expression, open-ended and coherent in all its parts. The answer lies in bringing about relative degrees of enclosure. Uh, and I like this. Um, it's basically the same type of language that um, you know Walter um, uses. And you know this image. I really like how um, it's a flattened landscape in a sense, and all but within this sort of like landscape, all areas are visible, uh, even in the enclosures. So this is an evolved um, version of the action office. It's called the public, public office landscape. Um, and here, the marketing materials um, says, public was designed to support fluid interactions and spontaneous conversations across the entire landscape keeping the office in a state of flow where people are engaged, focused, and able to move freely between collaborative and individual modes of work. Um, so you can really see this sort of parallel between the, you know, the way that um, this kind of um, new office interior and furniture landscapes really mimics the, the language of um, Walter and his peers. And I think it's also, um, Interesting to note how elegantly things are photographed and the design displays of the, the furniture and interior spaces um, which um, with, of these partitions both imply the usage um, or the shape of bodies and also the inventory of these, of inventory and ordering of um, both bodies and um, spaces. Um, so these um, display settings or installation partition spaces um, are much like um, a showroom of optimized situations, um, these kind of landscapes for interactions with the body. So here in this kind of um, way that um, Walter's done these installations, it's implying the body without having the body. So it's like a kind of total displacement of the body altogether. And I think, um, for, so this is um, a key component of a lot of corporate furniture design these days. Um, this is an image of um, a furniture piece called the social chair. Um, and it's a modular seating unit, um, which is part airport lounge, diner seating, cafe, club chair. Um, but the sort of strange part about it is if you sit here, you don't face anybody. So this is... Uh, you don't face anybody for any kind of collaborative work in a sense. It's 
social without being social, I guess. Um, so when I think about the previous images of um, Walter's installations without figures in relation to contemporary spaces that order our daily lives, what is the linkage between people and bodies now if Walter's storage um, solution display is the blueprint where the human figure is completely displaced? Um, all this culminates um, in my interest in the possibility of the non-compliant body, the individual person, and the body that doesn't fit or is not visible. Um, this is an image from my last show here in New York at 11R, which is called Embody. Here I'm going to end with an image of Walter's work in storage form, which is an embodiment of the object structure. Um, that addresses as, and is in tension with the body, a locker for potential action, both specific and contingent on the wild body. And that is the end. Hi, thank you for that. Very thoughtful. Um, I'm very interested in knowing, well, I sort of have two questions. One is, how do you understand the difference between mass-produced objects that interface with bodies in various ways versus like singular or individually or handmade objects? Like the difference between an office chair and a one-of-a-kind sculptural object. And then maybe related to that is, I've also thought about Foucault's ideas in relation to Walter, but more his late work about a thesis, self-transfer, like self-disciplined processes of self-transformation that occur like on the level of the body and objects, which was what he was writing about as he was dying of AIDS. And it was an interesting, not quite a reversal, but like the other side of the coin of his earlier work on discipline. So I wonder um, if you've thought about that work and maybe how that would apply also to theorizing um, Walter's work. Okay, let me, well, when you say the handmade versus the industrially, um, I mean, I guess I'm need a little more specificity um, because, well, when I think about Walter's work, it's more of um, it could be seen both as something that like prefigures what has become a very industrialized, you know, mode of um, of. Uh, like systems that have been, um, that taking up something that Walter set out to do that became very industrialized. So that that's a differentiation in seeing his, you know, work as something that prefigured something that we are now very aware of. Um, or, or do you mean like objects that are made now in relation to industrially produced or? Well, I'm just, well, what I was trying to draw a parallel to is um, how, um, and this is true for many artistic practices, not just like Walter himself as an example, but how um, the uptake of different conceptual conceits are quickly absorbed by like, um, um, uh, you know, managerial and corporate or capitalistic sort of um, uh, 
structures um, and systems. So that's sort of, it's not to say that Walter himself is that, but it's that how quickly things can be absorbed into the, or adopt the language quickly. Um, and um, it is, you know, I wanted to draw out the, uh, you know, to really state that he was making this work at a particular time when, you know, um, it was radical what he was doing, but there are, were, um, you know, sort of contradictory and uh, problematic aspects to the approaches that he was taking that also um, was were taken up by, you know, how you know, these kind of like managerial imperatives that we live with now. So I'm not saying that he is that, but I'm saying that it's interesting, this sort of, you know, how we can perceive the evolution of those kinds of ideas. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, thank you for that very dense presentation. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about. But I'm wondering if it's less about um, a body that has to be managed than a body that enjoys. That the difference between what he was working with and his era and ours is the injunction to enjoy. And the body not as something that is exploited because of its labor, but precisely because of the ways it enjoys. And when we see this kind of um, increasing singularity, one by one, your body, Howie's body, my body, Cheryl's body, etc. That's what we're seeing in the design. And I think this is where we see design on a kind of a mass scale meet the production of uh, a singular sculpture for one body. I'm just curious if you've thought about those things. One thing that came to mind is um, the, the slogan for Time Warner, enjoy better. I mean, that's an impossible injunction. Yeah. <laughs> How can one enjoy better? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's true. Um, well, as you were saying that, I was thinking about, uh, I had read some parts of the, there was something that um, was in his diary that said that, you know, going back to this uh, notion of how he was disappointed in, um, participants' um, involvement, or the, um, how the work was getting used, and he, there was, I forget the exact quote, but it was something like, um, some young people came and were having fun, and he said that wasn't right. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, that's what he said in his, you know. Yes, 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 so it's just, right, right. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. Well, which is, goes back to like the, this idea of you must be free or like the enjoy better. It's sort of like, how does that, how is it possible, you know, for this? You can't escape from the demand. Right. Free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe we have one more question. Anybody? Okay. Maybe if you just talk about it. What, what is the relation he had, or? Mm -hmm. 
For him or for me? Oh, um, I'm not sure what he would think. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't like it. <laughs> um, and I think actually there was a, like a fashion show that was done within one of his exhibitions. Um, I think I saw it when I was Googling around. Um, and I thought that was kind of a definite misuse of his work, probably, um, in his eyes. Um, for me, um, I don't have any position to the industry of fashion, but I am interested in um, the forms that, you know, ideas of clothing or these things that are out. Uh, involve the body, which is, um, so in that way, like, I can, you know, I see it as, like, a, a valid place to mine um, where the, we are, um, where we use that clothing form as an object or material to expand, you know, the possibilities of one's practice, so, um, yeah. Last one. It's not really a question, but I, I'm interested in the, que the first question that was asked about um, Foucault's late work in relation to kind of the presentation. And it's something that interests me too, the kind of turn he takes late life, near death, <clears throat> from kind of, um, yeah, kind of thinking about the self and the transformation of the self. Um, and I think of it, and this is more of a comment to you, <laughs> uh, but also kind of in relation to the kind of care of the self that was kind of in the the jacuzzi kind of discussion um, about how like, you know, in Foucault's arc of his work that towards late life, I think he was really searching for a possibility of agency for the self where, you know, in 90% of his work looked like dread for the individual um, that when faced with a very mortal situation um, and backed into a corner of a specific discourse in which his whole life is towards kind of like excavating the possibilities of discourse that one puts him, puts him, their, him or herself out um, as an individual to think about how can I be an agent in these kind of structures that look really stuck or prescribed. And um, there's this kind of libertarian streak to it um, that is about freedom, um, but um, it's a, a very agnostic type of freedom that won't claim good or bad. And I think that's where I think the Walter work is like, it's the kind of suspension of a judgment of good or bad. Um, yeah. Thank you, Howie. Okay, any last thoughts? Well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.